When Ronald Hunt went out for his usual jog just before dawn that morning, I'm sure he had no idea it would be his last. surgery i'd worked trauma center before but i had never seen anything like this patient in response notified neurosurgeon Dr. 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 multiple lacerations near amputation of left arm i'm going to intubate 7.52 what's hanging large bore iv in left and right anticube like to ringers up iv1 has 400 cc count two has 600 blood pressure is 90 over 64 A falling fast patient 100 percent o2 hydrate lost six units rbc's keep the pressure on he's flat lining give me the paddles Lieutenant Ortega? Yes. Amy Winslow. I'm sorry. He was a friend. One of my oldest. A mentor for a lot of us. I'm so sorry. Where did the tiger come from? Where did it go? How does the tiger just disappear? But that was just the first mystery I encountered that amazing week. The next day, I drove up into Marin County. been invited by a woman named Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Winslow, I'm so pleased you could come. Hello. Here you go. Oh. Her husband had been caretaker of this small estate. He'd had a stroke while visiting the city last year. If you hadn't come to his aid, he would have died on the spot. Now, don't you deny it. It's true. Your kindness was a blessing to him, young lady. And it gave me another whole year with him. I was sad to hear of his death. My husband loved this place. He lived here all his life. It was originally bought by an Englishman, a Captain Basil, in 1899. Uh, he employed my husband's grandfather as caretaker. Shortly afterwards, Basil disappeared, but he left a trust fund for the Hudson family to continue caring for the place, with the stipulation that electricity must be constantly provided by steam generators. The electricity had to remain on until January the 1st, 2000 AD. If it was allowed to stop, the Hudson family contract would be immediately terminated. <laughs> What's the shop? What? I lost my, my parents in the 89 quite there on the Oakland Expressway, and it... So... So, will you continue living here? Oh, I'm afraid old Captain Basil hadn't counted on all the taxes starting up. And then the 29 crash, and finally the big <laughs> S&L collapse. The house is going to be sold for a quarter of what it's worth. I tried to get in touch with my son, but he's a gadabout, and the sale is this week. I wanted you to have the chance to buy the place in return for your kindness to my husband. I'd be happy to stay on. Mrs. Hudson, that's a lovely gesture. You'll do it, then. I would love to, but I'm barely surviving now. My parents left me a house I can hardly maintain. I've got student loans. I'm afraid it would be impossible for me. I'm as disappointed as you are. Well... Let me at least offer you some lunch. <laughs> mm. 
Mrs. Hudson asked me to pick out a bottle of Captain Basil's wine from the cellar. The Hudsons had never touched them before, but now it didn't seem to matter. That was when I saw the quake damage and made the discovery. Take it easy. What is the year? It's 1993. Huh. Seven years sooner than I'd hoped, but I'll adjust. How long have you been in there? Since 1899. Right. That would make you the world's greatest scientist. Well, the biochemistry was very elementary. I found a drunk almost frozen in the London snow who miraculously survived. And that gave me the idea of lowering my body temperature and using brandy as an antifreeze to keep my blood slowly flowing. I retarded my bodily processes through self-hypnosis. And a mechanical device cooled and cleansed my blood and administered vitamin E as an antitoxin. The key element, however, is a serum derived from the black fish of the Bering Sea, which every winter are frozen and revived during the spring. What made you so sure this would work? Because it was logical. And I fitted the apparatus with the device to administer a stimulant should the electricity fail before the year 2000. But upon awakening, I still felt weak and injected myself with more. With too much, you went into cardiac arrest. What besides adrenaline did you inject yourself with? <laughs> a formula of my own devising. I'm sure it's all terribly antiquated by this day and age, but it might prove of some minor historical interest to the doctor for whom you nurse. Why do you think I'm a nurse? The well, professional way you took my pulse, your knowledge of adrenaline, the way you elevated my feet to ward off shock, and the faint but distinct odor of medicinal alcohol on your clothing. Oh, dear God. It is him. Would you mind telling me who you are? Come, come, my dear. No need to play games. By the dust on your shoes, I can see that you have been in the laboratory. Therefore, it must have been you who took out the tin box containing my identification. I only went in there to fix the shorted wires. I never huh? saw your box. Uh, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. First, tell me, you don't think you're Captain Basil, do you? Of course not, my good woman. There is no Captain Basil. I came to America under that name to conceal my true identity. I am, of course, Sherlock Holmes. Get serious. Madam, I have never been more serious in my considerably eventful life. Sherlock Holmes is fictional. <laughs> a lot of criminals I sent to Newgate prison certainly wish that that were true. Ah. Au contraire, my dear. I was and am quite real. My friend, Dr. John Watson, provided notes of my cases, which were rendered into rather overdramatic narrative by an Irishman, uh, named Conan Doyle. 
Right. Okay, I'm sure you have some way to prove this. It would be rather foolish not to have, eh? My tin box contains photographs of myself with several notable friends of the day. Dr. Freud, George Bernard Shaw, P.T. Barnum, plus my fingerprint records from Scotland Yard, signed and dated by Inspector Lestrade himself. Also in my tin box was a quantity of jewels of considerable value to help re-establish myself in this new day and age. His stern conviction made him seem almost credible, though I was convinced he was a complete wacko. You wake up! Why exactly did you do all this? I have already solved the mysteries of the 19th century. And after the death of my arch enemy, that evil Napoleon of crime, Professor James Moriarty, life ceased to hold any fascination for me. I became morose, succumbing more and more to my major vice, injecting myself with a 7% solution of cocaine, until Watson actually feared for my life. In an effort to stimulate me, Watson introduced me to H.G. Wells of the time machine. Through Wells, I realized that the greatest mystery of life remained unsolved. The mystery of what would happen in the future. So, I resolved to have a look at myself and hopefully find intriguing new crimes to solve and worthy new adversaries like Moriarty. Why San Francisco? Distance. Moriarty's faithful henchman are legion. I knew they might attempt to discover my whereabouts and destroy me. My housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, had a son living in San Francisco. I engaged his family as caretakers after secretly arranging this laboratory. <coughs> there, there, my dear. No need to be frightened. I just need some information from you. You saved him. You brought him back to life. Yes, she is an excellent nurse. She's not a nurse. She's a doctor. Really? Well, well. It seems that I am in your debt. Doctor? Winslow. Amy Winslow. Doctor. <laughs> is your husband nearby, madam? No, he died last month. My condolences. Then I will need your careful assistance to illuminate a detail or two. Here is what I have deduced. <coughs> In June or July, about 45 years ago, a robbery and a death occurred in my laboratory. An old man who was stoop-shouldered and walked with a cane in his left hand discovered my chamber with the assistance of a boy of about 12 who wore a blue shirt and possessed very low morals. They opened the lid of the chest wherein I lay. Assuming I was dead because I was cold, they ransacked the room until they found the tin box containing my valuables and identification papers. They lit a torch and were about to set the place afire when they were surprised by a man of about five feet ten inches with red hair. Yes, my husband. The old man drew a pistol. Your husband scuffled with it until the old man was clubbed from behind with a wine bottle by a woman of your height. The old man fell, striking his head against the brick abutment near the floor, dying instantly. Yes. During the fracas, the boy bolted, running awkwardly, opening a nasty wound on the back of his ah. right hand. You and your husband saw my corpse, but finding no identification, and never having seen Captain Battle, feared opening a can of worms. So, you left the old man's body where it was for a few days. When no police investigated, you dragged him out and buried him. Then resealed the chamber, breaking up the edges. That's exactly how it happened. Oh, come on. How could you possibly piece all that together after two minutes? It is, my dear doctor, what I do. It is my trade. So, the person who stole my papers and valuables would now be a dishonorable man of 55 to 60 with a scar on the back of his right hand and who walks awkwardly. Why dishonorable? Oh, come, come, because he never returned my papers and valuables or reported the crime. And the ambulatory awkwardness results from his club foot. How did you guess all that after 45 years? I never guess. It's a shocking habit, destructive to the logical faculty. And I would really have some concern about being your patient, doctor. Do you observe nothing? Ah, oh, very well. So that you may understand my methods. You must not only see, but observe. I have carefully swept the floor of the laboratory clean before beginning my long sleep. So, any items on it now must have accumulated since then. Particularly, the dust. 
You can easily see the undisturbed dust on the scale there. It's of a certain thickness. Now, that thickness represents an accumulation of 90 years. Now, here is a footprint with a subsequent accumulation of dust only half as thick as that undisturbed. Hence, it was made about 45 years ago. The same half thickness occurs on the books thrown down, confirming the hypothesis. All right, but... In this footprint is a dried peony petal. And in this climb, peonies only blossom in June. Mm -hmm. This set of footprints was made by a man who shuffled slightly, indicating advancing age. Further evidenced by his use of a cane. You see the cane marks in the dust? The stoop-shouldered? The cane of a stoop-shouldered man will come to rest the head of his feet because his curved back puts his shoulders and arms forward. The rest is quite obvious, even to the most casual observer. That blackened circle on the ceiling there shows that a torch was lighted. Indeed, its remnants can be seen stamped out. These larger footprints indicate the entrance of a man of about five feet ten, Mr. Hudson. His height being deduced from the length of his stride. His tuft of red hair indicates that the old man had grabbed Mr. Hudson by the hair, and their struggle is borne out by the intermingled footprints. Getting the idea, Watson? Windsor? Now, here is a much smaller footprint, and near it, a hairpin, exactly like the one Mrs. Hudson has in her hair today. And here, a fragment of the wine bottle she broke over the old man's head. Had she been any taller, she would have struck this hanging metal lampshade, which is undented. Here fell the evil old man, having drawn but not fired his pistol, the outline of which can be seen in the dust. The dust also tells us that he made no further movement therefore dying instantly, until he was dragged away several days later. See the scuff marks. The passage of a few days is indicated by the fact that much blood had time to be absorbed into the porous brick floor. Mrs. Hudson, did he have any identification? Uh, no, sir. Huh? The edge of the chest wherein I laid has four distinct sets of fingerprints. And Mrs. Hudson's comment earlier, it is him, confirmed that she had seen me before. The new brickwork along the seam of the wine rack is clearly of a later construction than the rest of the house. And a careful examination of this exposed nail shows an accumulation of skin, dried blood, and a tiny piece of blue material indicating the escaping boy holding the tin box dust gouged a serious wound on the back of his right hand. The club footed. Observe. Look at the boy's footprints. The right one is curved in and under. Your diagnosis, Doctor, must be... Um, a, a deformity. Brava, Winslow, brava. Isn't it rewarding to use the senses the Almighty gave us? Now then, Mrs. Hudson, is there any mail for Captain Basil? Yes. Postmark London, 1899. I hope you don't ever again know such despair. If you do, this letter maybe will help you reach some peace. You always manage before when troubled, you can again. Slumber, rest yourself, but also remember H and naturally M send support. Is there anyone in all of America whom you take as a friend? Care for yourself. It's signed my? My brother, my crop. Then, for the first time, a tiny crack appeared as he realized... My late brother. Well, this explains everything. The old man with the cane was Henry Moriarty, come to avenge his despicable brother, James Moriarty, who died by my hand. And knowing the ties that bind the evil Moriarty clan, the club-footed youth was probably his grandson. Given his family background, he's not only dishonorable, but profoundly dangerous. Excuse me, but how do you get that from this letter? I'm rather surprised that Mycroft would have written in such an obvious code, knowing it might have fallen into the hands of the supremely intelligent Moriarty's. You really must learn to read between the lines, my dear, or in this case, every third word. I don't know if this will reach you before you slumber, but H.M. is in America. Take care. Well, Mrs. Hudson has dispatched old Henry for us, but I have a theory that each person becomes the epitome of their family heritage. From the way you describe the Moriarty's, that would make this grandson the vilest, the most dangerous of all? Precisely. Isn't it delightful? Well, shall we?
Shall we clean up this minor little inconvenience of mine so that I can proceed to more demanding mysteries, such as the murder by the Phantom Tiger? Wait a minute. How could you possibly know about that? Elementary, my dear. Winslow. According to Mrs. Hudson, completely gone. Your uh, Rip Van Winkle process would be worth a fortune, but your key serum was derived from the blackfish? Correct. Well, they were driven to extinction 30 years ago. How oh, careless. Well, my friend, Charles Darwin, said we are creatures of adaptation. I shall put his theory to the test. What, you preferred the beard? No, uh, this... This is fine. Do you know of a barber in the vicinity? Actually, I don't think Is this the right one, Mr. Holmes? Indeed it is. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. This will help us bring the blackguard to justice. But even if you could find him, hadn't the statue of limitations run out on the robbery? Retribution, Mrs. Hudson. That's what I'll have, and regain my identification papers. Wouldn't Scotland Yard still have your fingerprints? Quite likely. I must wire them. Kindly direct me to a telegraph. No, 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 I'll be fine. You try walking around after sleeping for nearly 90 years. There is a Chinese proverb which says when you save someone's life, you become responsible for them. I want you to come to the city with me so I can keep an eye on your condition. Thank you, but I prefer to be beholden to no one, particularly a... A woman. I could see it on his face. I'm afraid you haven't got a choice. In rivo fine, sine rumo sum. Right. You water up the creek without a paddle. What kind of wine is that? Extremely rare vintage. Interesting. Mr. Benz was experimenting with cell propulsion in my day. I'm rather surprised he didn't settle for electricity rather than petroleum. Seems any thinking person would have. Yeah, well, you may be disappointed by quite a few things. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, exhilarated by the prospects. Shall we be off? We said goodbye to Mrs. Hudson, who remained behind to pack up her house. I was still very suspicious, but he certainly gave every impression of a man trying to absorb a new world. You know, attitudes towards women have also changed quite a bit. Your talents have extended beyond the embroidery frame. I wasn't going quite fast enough to push him out of the car. You've come a long way, baby. Yes. You know, you'll really have to develop a less patronizing attitude. Mm -hmm. It must be very difficult to have left your brother behind. Were there any other loved ones? No. No love is an emotion I studiously avoid. It tends to bias the logical mind. Of course, I regret the loss of Mycroft and good old Watson. They are carefully filed in memory for future reference. But don't you feel the loss? No. The world is a tragedy to those who feel, but a comedy to those who think. But I prefer to think most specifically about crime. Why? Because it represents the darkest side of human nature. Exactly. So why dwell on it? I mean, I know it's out there, but I don't like to think about Your it. Your head is in the sand, my dear. Evil. Unless checked, begets more and greater evil. Like this new nemesis of mine, this club-footed Moriarty. Don't you think if this man were as terrible as you say is, I would have heard of him? I'm seldom aware of the viper until it strikes. But I'll ferret him out. And then focus on this delicious tiger man. You said the victim was a police officer. Retired and renowned for years he headed the police academy. Lieutenant Ortega told Lieutenant me... Lieutenant Ortega is? One of Hans Starr graduates. They had a father-son relationship. He was grief-stricken at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I will need more data. I can't make bricks without clay. Well, you're about to run into a mountain of data. <laughs> Seven. 
I took a last walk here before beginning my long sleep. Ah, I think a certain destiny is operating here. Nineteen ninety four Baker Street. Mm. Hello, Lucy. It's okay, he's a friend. Mm. Mm. A little different than your Victorian tastes, huh? Mm. But nonetheless, revealing of your personality. Oh, really? What can you tell me? Oh, not that much, and there have certainly been changes over the years which may affect slightly my deductions. Oh, pray proceed. Well, I would say that you are the daughter of a flamboyant sculptor. You're a graduate of Stanford University. You speak French. You are highly intelligent and have an excellent bedside manner with children. You're affiliated with the Marguerite Perry Clinic on Sutter Street. You have strong opinions, but prefer to express yourself through quiet and more secure to avenues. Despite unusual scientific experimentation, you are not totally consumed by medicine. You are attempting to write the work of historical fiction, but are much frustrated in your efforts and are thus far unpublished. You enjoy wagering on sports and despite your conservative appearance, harbor a deep romanticism and a desire for adventure in spite of the injury it has brought you. You are intrigued by the bizarre and apparently find humor in the male sexual organ. On holidays, you prefer exotic tropical locales, such as Panama, if I'm not much mistaken. You prefer to inhale your cocaine rather than injecting it, as I do. You were recently abandoned by your husband, who was a painter. His departure occasioned an outburst of childish anger from you. However, you are taking positive action to begin a new life without him. You are sentimental. You had a grey, short-haired female cat named Twinkie, recently deceased. Damn, I... Damn it! Just who the hell are you? Why are you and Mrs. Hudson doing this whole number? Is this some sort of outrageous practical... Oh, it's Max, isn't it? He put you up to this. He loves this whole... Performance art junk. Where did he dig you up at the improv? God, how could I be so stupid as to fall for this whole asleep for 90 years routine? That bastard, Max! Why on earth would you make such an unfounded supposition? Why? Why? Because with the exception of a few obvious errors, everything you said is absolutely dead on, and there's no way you could have possibly known it without being told. Errors? Oh, please, drop the Sherlock Holmes crap and get the hell out of my house. Madam, if you'll kindly quell your feminine hysteria it for one moment. It is nonsensus, hysteria. Get out. I show you everything I've deduced is perfectly obvious to the trained observant eye. Oh, take your trained observant eye and stick it up your nose. Martians have landed. Damn right, I'll leave a message for you. How dare you drag that sweet old Mrs. Hudson into such a warped, low-life, nasty trick? Pretty damn good. You do okay busking, huh? Lefty. Sherlock, Lefty is an odd name for someone who's right-handed. That's on account of my politics. And how did you know I was a righty? Oh, I once wrote a trifling monograph on the subject of manual dominance. Also, how 74 different professions can be deduced from the observation of hands. Oh, yeah? What's my line? Mariner. Geez, you could tell that from my hands? From the fine lines around your eyes that sailors get from squinting on a bright sea. Also, from the corner of a tattoo visible on the back of your wrist, which I take to be an anchor, and... Man. Oh, yeah. Turn up the volume. Volume is... Sound. 
Francisco Aquarium was the scene tonight of another bizarre death. Night watchman Tom Waldsmith had apparently been drugged. When he awoke in his office, he immediately investigated. He was unprepared for what he discovered. In one tank, thickly clouded by blood, was the body of a woman. She had been nearly chewed to pieces because the tank contained a vicious, voracious breed of fish called piranha. Piranha. The victim was Leslie Browder. She was a criminology professor at San Francisco State. Many of us on the force had been her students. Lieutenant Ortega, this is the second extremely unconventional murder in two days. Does it have any connection to Ronald Hunt being killed by that tiger? It's too early to tell. Both victims were related to the police. Both were brutally killed by animals. Other than that, there's no connection. <laughs> oh, come, come, Lieutenant Ortega. There are at least two more connections. And so blatantly obvious. It's right there in front of you. What? This city really does have need of my services. You some kind of cop? No. Merely a student of crime. Tell me, did you ever know an evil club-footed man? Jesus, save us. I did. You did? Kill you as soon as look at you. Big fella he was. Chinese. <laughs> was swept overboard off the Tortugas. You know any whale in Jennings? <laughs> How a few bars? Mama, don't let your babies grow up. Be Country more. I'm jolly. That's it. You got it, Shadrach. Amy, 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 look, look. Will you calm down and listen? Look, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Don't do this to me, Max. I'm not doing anything except missing you. Oh, yeah? You probably got some candy in your mouth right now. That's not fair, Amy. But look, look, I, I, I swear to you, I, I don't know anything about any Mrs. Hudson or, or anything about what happened today. Honest. Not a reliable word coming from you, Max. Well, what can I say, Amy? Just bye. you, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about poor Mr. Holmes. Is he all right? yourself at home. Uh, I've got a suite across the park. Ah, the fashionable side. Bon voyage. Punk Zappa, we get in or what? Yeah, 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 but we're not taking us all to Pavone's guys, all right? Come on, Zap. You know, they'll cut us the best deal. That's bull, man. He stiffed us last time. And old man Pavone had him do the hit and run on Billy. Look, you don't know that for sure, okay? Yeah, I do. It was Pavone who called the hit and Billy was blood. Look, man, man let's just do the car. Nah, man, that radio ain't worth it. Come on. Yeah, but check out the case of booze. I beg your pardon. I can see from your profession you might have contact with the man I'm looking for. Who the hell are you, mister? Holmes. Sherlock. Hey, and I'm Debbie Boone. Pleased to meet you. Get the hell out of here, okay? You'll be about 55. Rather an arch criminal. And walk with a pronounced limp. Hey, why don't you just take off, man? Before you walk with a pronounced limp. It's very important you tell me what you know. You don't know nothing, okay? Now get your fancy ass out of here. Did you hear me? You deaf? I said get out of here. Oh. 
Actually, I studied Baritza with Master Barry himself. Oh, study this. Have you no leader? What are you talking, man? Mano, a mano. If you dare. Wow. Oh. Are you ignorant of the Queen's Bray rules? Magician can infer the possibility of the Atlantic without ever having seen or heard it. I simply observed the facts and deduced logically from there. That bronze bust of yourself as a child in the flamboyant style of Rodin is signed by your father. On your bookshelf is a Stanford alumna tankard and books on philosophy, several in French, which attest to your intelligence. These objets d'art fashioned by young hands, some signed, thanks, Dr. W., indicate children's fondness for you. This parking pass amid your mail shows your affiliation with the Marguerite Perry Clinic and its location. From this sample of your penmanship, even the most casual student of handwriting analysis would deduce that you are a woman of strong opinions, tempered by quieter, more circuitous approaches. Despite that unusual scientific apparatus over there, it is obvious that you are not consumed by doctoring. Note the unfound quality of your current medical periodicals. You are endeavoring to write on this electrical typewriter. And various works of historical fiction on your desk show your preference for that kind of literature. These crumpled papers in and around the waste paper basket are the classic telltales of a frustrated writer. There are no books here bearing your name as author, which you would surely display if you were published. You're right. That newspaper with teams, Mark, suggests that you enjoy wagering on a sport called hockey. Hockey. Right. You're decidedly more conservative in appearance than others I've glimpsed, but these travel magazines lying around, which are well thumbed, Indicate that you harbor a deep romantic desire for adventure, borne out by your motor bicycle outside, a most adventurous mode of transportation, and dangerous, judging by the scratches on the right-hand side and the way you favor your right leg. Your amusement with the male sexual organ is suggested by your license plate, Big Willie. Willie being common British slang for the male part. Your preference for tropical vacations is clear by the number of folk items crafted in the style peculiar to Panama. Your use of cocaine is obvious by a fine white powder on your glass table and a straw for inhaling it. The tan line on your ring finger shows a recently removed wedding band. And your bitterness towards your husband's departure is clear from these photos of him tossed carelessly aside. His paints and canvases are stacked haphazardly by the front door and your outburst of childish anger is clear from the bent nails where you ripped the paintings from the walls then smeared paint across the canvases. These marks on the rug show that you are taking positive action to start over by moving the furniture to new positions. A few short gray animal hairs along the front of the couch and claw scratches on the table leg tell of the cat. This collar has a tag labeled Twinkie, i.e. being the suffix for a female. And the collar's emptiness affirms that Twinkie is, alas, no longer with us. That you kept it testifies to your sentimentality. You see how elementary it truly is if one only trains oneself to observe, Winslow? I think you really are Sherlock Holmes. That was your first clue. Actually, most women don't possess logical minds, so it is natural that you should have difficulty in conceiving my deductions. Hey, you're brilliant, okay, but my being female has nothing to do with you it. You may be right. Watson and all of Scotland Yard certainly seem slow with it to me also. I had to constantly exercise patience with them. Well, I'm sure the patience worked both ways, considering your incredible arrogance. Now, there are a few details which I had to clarify for even such a logical mind as yours. 
This unusual scientific apparatus is just a cappuccino maker. A device for making a coffee-like beverage. My license plate, Big Willie, is actually the name of a wacko guy from my hippie days. Big Willie was always so confused, I started using his name to mean confusion. If someone is Big Willie, it means they don't understand. Like you didn't. Get it? Yes, I am no longer Big Willie. Well, not about that, anyway. Panama, yes. Tourist, no. Red Cross doctor in the 89 crisis took this bullet in my right leg. A woman in a military skirmish? Times have changed, Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, but only a romantic would have kept it. I am trying to write, but that is a computer which allows me to record, store, cross-reference, and alter the work, as well as access other resource material via telephone. I saw he felt an immediate kinship between my PC and his own computer-like mind. My uh, cocaine is actually an artificial sweetener for iced tea, which I drink with a straw. In your day, the casual use of narcotics was slightly more acceptable. Today, it's a criminal offense, though just as debilitating. Not... A wedding band, just a friendship ring. I only lived with Max, and I dumped him when I caught him playing doctor with a candy striper. And finally, those smears on the canvases are Max's style of painting, not from my tantrum, which I admit I did have. Thank you. Most educational. Now, if you've no objections, I'll continue my schooling. I'm most anxious to get in touch with the 1990s, clear up this little problem with my club-footed nemesis, and turn my focus to helping Lieutenant Ortega solve these two strange murders involving a tiger. Two murders involving a tiger? But I thought just one. Don't let me intrude. It's, uh, menu-driven. User-friendly? You'll figure it out. Just don't erase anything. And, uh, there's a guest room down the hallway. And please, smoke on the porch. with my eggs. I was just heating the tin in that little microwave oven. I got it. Oh, what? Oh, yes. What is this? Uh, that's my Persian slipper. I, I keep my tobacco in the tub. Smells like you've been smoking the Persian socks outside, please. Oh. What? It's difficult to imagine you ever having a large posterior. Your hippie days? Uh, not that kind of hippies. Um, flower children, peace, love, drugs. Drugs? I saw some illustrations of flower children last night on your computer. An entire encyclopedia in there. Not as much information on crime as I might have hoped for, which is my only real interest, but I was impressed by the high price of illegal cocaine. Millions. And I was delighted by the way that I could communicate with other computers. The one at the hospital told me that all your patients are doing well. If that is private information, Mr. However, I was unable to access the city hall or police computers to gain more information on the tiger murders, or to search birth records for Moriarty's. Well, you would need access codes. Or a good pair of legs. Is city hall still where it used to be? His pulse was still as irregular as his character, so I decided to go with him. I gave him some of Max's clothes to wear, and we searched the microfilm records trying to get a lead on Moriarty's lineage. It wasn't easy, but I was impressed with his tenacity and astonishing ability to cross-reference data in his head. The first Moriarty descendant we found was a photographer. Holmes was remarkably cool-headed considering this was his first exposure to... exposure. The photographer gave us no lead to a Moriarty with a deformed foot and a scar in his right hand. So we tried another Moriarty, a roadie for a rock group called The Walking Dead. No info, but Holmes got his first stick of gum. A newspaper in a bookstore caught his eye, though he was still having trouble with automatic doors. He noticed something else as well.
but he still refused to tell me how the piranha murder tied to the tiger, and I had to get onto the clinic. He wanted to check a reference in the library and convince me that he'd be fine on his own. So I missed all the excitement. <laughs> Zapper got away. Holmes finally did have some luck, and in a most unexpected place. Then you do know such a man, Father Moriarty. Do you believe in God, sir? Yes. I have deduced there must be a merciful providence by observing a rose. There is no need for the rose. Its fragrance and color are an embellishment of life, not a necessity. It is only goodness which gives extras. So who but a great beneficence would have created it? Then you would agree to the existence of a darker force. I am certain of it. Such a force has dominated my family for over a century. I chose the cloth in an effort to fight it. I wish I could have been more successful. Perhaps I can help you to be. The man you seek is a consummately evil human being who's cleverly eluded the police for decades. His cathedral is the dark tower of organized crime where he's an archbishop. I'm ashamed to say that he's my cousin. His name is James Moriarty Booth. He felt the visit to police headquarters was finally in order. So you got some info on Jimmy the Gimp, huh? Well, that's great, Mr. Uh... Holmes. Oliver W. Oh, listen, Detective Griffin can use all the help he can get to bring down old Booth. Say, you been to the new building before? Well, it's totally state of the art. A whole wing for forensics and pathology. This is the best SID in the country. Scientific Investigation Division. Huh. These guys are aces. Holmes was intrigued by the department's capabilities, but a vague, uneasy feeling was beginning to gnaw inside him. Hang here a sec. Though he didn't realize it at the moment, Holmes got his first glimpse of his first client. He said he was getting the last of some major new evidence that would put in Ray Cape of own away. That's got to be why he's missing. Mrs. Ortega, we don't even know that he is missing. He's working undercover. But Luis always checks in with me. He hasn't called since last night, and he always... Hey, you think I want to lose the best shortstop on our softball team? Now, savita has got Pavone in there right now, grilling. So please, don't bother us again, Lieutenant Cevita. Unless you have substantial evidence. I am going to nail your fat ass, Pavone, with or without Ortega. Holmes would later tell me how he immediately connected Pavone with the Tiger and Piranha murders. Mr. Holmes, take the Griffin's office, the second door. Yo, Holmes, how's it going? Detective Griffin? They tell me your name is Oliver, but I can sure use your brother Sherlock around here. Yes. Particularly in the case of James Moriarty Booth. Oh, yeah, right, right. Wasn't Moriarty Sherlock's big, bad boogeyman? You know, I quit reading all those stories because Sherlock was such an unbelievable character. Oh, how so? Well, hell, man. No dude could really walk into a room and scope out all that crap Holmes could in ten seconds. You really don't believe that someone like myself could walk into your office and immediately tell that 12 years ago you left Detroit, where you were very much in the public eye but not well liked. But your father still operates a plumbing business there and has a female secretary with a fondness for cocoa. That you worked your way up from the streets, are very meticulous in your habits, but are stubborn and vain about your age. That you are a crack shot and sight your pistol with your left eye, though you happen to be right-handed. That within the last hour you were in room 304 down the hall. That you enjoy helping short people at pasta for lunch, which is perhaps why your nickname is Noodles. Though your favorite fruit would appear to be watermelon. Hey, 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 hold on, man, before I get pissed. You drink on duty? No, man, I mean as in riled, angry. Where the hell are you pulling this crap from? I can see your big willy. What? Allow me to explain. 
The front page of the Detroit Free Press, framed on the wall there, gives you a departure date and the public's attitude. Your nameplate indicates that you are a junior. And this letter has the return address of the Detroit plumbing firm with the same name. Therefore, I deduce that the correspondent is your father. His secretary spilled a bit of cocoa on the envelope before sealing it. You see where the flap hides it? And a touch of her lipstick on the envelope attests to her gender. Your military bearing, your polished shoes, and your... Your earthy style of speech attests to a time spent pounding a beat. The general tidiness of this office indicates a very meticulous working nature. When I entered, you were holding a paper at arm's length, stubbornly denying the spectacles you obviously need and which are there on your desk with an easy reach. Your marksmanship is indicated by that trophy over there. And when you tossed the wad of trash, you used your right hand but aimed with your left eye. There's a wet paint sign on the door of room 304 down the hall. And the color matches a still damp fleck of paint on your right elbow. Your helpfulness to short people is clear from that commendation on the wall. A tiny piece of pasta clings to your tie. And the cup, which I can see a portion in front of you, has your nickname printed on it. A ceramic slice of watermelon atop your bookcase. And why don't they like me in Detroit? Ah, the newspaper headline. Griffin leaving, lost to no time. That's Motown, Jack. You got it exactly backwards. They love me there. That commendation, that's from my little league team. That's baseball, in case you hadn't heard. Not some midget civic group. And nobody calls me noodles. That's what I ate for lunch. And as for the watermelon, that's a joke. What, what the hell time zone are you from anyway? That nine in home stomach was becoming a knot. Now, they said you had something for me on Jimmy the Gimp Boo. Ah, yes. Well, actually, I was hoping for some information about him from you, too. I was robbed by him. He stole some very important identification papers and about a million pounds in precious stones. When? About 45 years ago. 45 years ago? Yes. I'm aware that the statute of limitations has expired, but if you can just give me some information, I'm sure I can be of assistance in capturing it. Hey, man, check this out. Booth has robbed, cheated, hustled, whored, raped, killed, all over this city for 30 years, and always manages to keep his hands clean enough to avoid prosecution, just like Pavon. Whatever racket one of them doesn't operate, the other does. His flunkies are afraid to testify because they are afraid of getting killed. Now, I have personally been after Mr. Booth for over 12 years, and the only assistance I need is something airtight in the way of evidence. Now, you got any? Not yet, but you may be interested in my thoughts on the tiger and piranha murders. Gee, no. I'm telling you, it's incredible. What? Yeah, that tiger was weird enough, and then the aquarium. But this new one, man. Well, what, what? That hot assistant DA, Jacob Weiss, or Tagus pal, he comes out of his house, gets into a souped-up VW bug. Somebody's rigged a seatbelt so it won't unlock, but he don't know that. Now, he's backing his car out of the driveway, a car blocks it, and then the cement truck dumps its load right through his sunroof. But it ain't cement. It's beetles. They chewed him up. Uh, here it comes now. Tiger. Holmes felt as frustrated and stymied about his own problem as Mrs. Ortega did about hers. He decided it was time for action. It wasn't until we were almost there before Holmes told me where I was taking him. Both lives here? This is not a good idea going right up to his front door. Who mentioned the front door? Hang on, what exactly are you planning to do? I'm going in there quietly to see what I can find. Holmes. If not my valuables and my identification papers, then some sort of incriminating evidence to bring down the mighty Miss Boo. Forget it. We are out of here. Come on. I'm an excellent burglar, my dear. Always in the moral cause, of course. My tutor was Charles Peace, the best cracksman in London. He gave me this. Would you be good enough to secure the base for me? No way. No way. You are not going to go up there. Thanks ever so for your support. Holmes, damn it, come back here. Would you please keep your voice down? I will not! Holmes! Uh. 
did you tell him who I am? Ah, you recognize my face, Mr. Booth. I see you still have the scar on the back of your hand from that night 45 years ago. I didn't know that Holmes had any offspring. My grandfather thought he was gay. Indeed I am. Never gay. The man confronting a sinister genius. I'm not a descendant, however. I am the original Sherlock Holmes. I saw a cold corpse. Cold, yes. Corpse, no. I am indeed the very man whose valuables you took 45 years ago. Perhaps you'd care to refresh your memory by comparing my face with the photographs you took, if you still possess them. I did keep them, actually. Souvenir of my first big score. Those diamonds set me up in business. An evil empire that includes drug smuggling, prostitution, protection rackets, money laundering, whatever that may be. What can I say? Business is good. And I guess I have you to thank for it all. But how the hell can you be alive? A little chemistry and a lot of determination to bring a scoundrel like you to justice. Mr. Holmes, within these walls, I'll admit certain things to you, but I run a very careful business. The cops have been after me for years. But Sherlock Holmes wasn't on the case till now, and may not be for long. Excuse me, I am so sorry to bother you, but uh, my name is Dr. Amy Winslow. I'm from the Perry Clinic, and one of our psychiatric patients got away from us this evening. I'm, I'm afraid I saw him climbing over the... Uh, the back wall into your estate. My grandfather, Henry, had this real obsession about finding you. It took him over 40 years. Told me how you killed his brother, James. That's who I'm named for. And you were carrying on the family tradition. I really like my grandpa, Henry. Not enough to report his death or reclaim his body. It wasn't important. What was important was the education he gave me, and part of that was the Moriarty sense of vengeance. So, they think you're a mental case. Of course, if they saw these photos in ID, they might think again. Now, you might end up on the cover of Rolling Stone. That saved everyone a lot of trouble. No! Confound you! Jones! No! I seem to have succeeded where my grandfather failed. I destroyed the famous Sherlock Holmes. You, whoever you are, are nothing but a crackpot. <laughs> have a nice day. At home, there was more bad news. A return fax from Scotland Yard. Their records on Holmes had been lost in a fire back in 1911. Now he truly felt like a non-person. He wanted his syringe and vial of cocaine, but naturally I refused. He went off to his room, brooding. I read for a while to the sound of his violin. I fell asleep, awakening about 2 a.m. to discover he was gone. I was concerned about his mental state, so I went looking. At first, I had no luck, but then I remembered. Pier 7. God, it's beautiful here, isn't it? I cannot look at that city without seeing the leering face of James Moriarty Booth hanging over it like an evil specter. And that my valuables were used to found his empire is... is beyond irony. A vermin like Booth and Henrique Pavon are free to spread their pestilence throughout this city while I am helpless. Useless. Henry, you are amazing. You've given yourself the opportunity to do something no one's ever done before. Travel a hundred years into the future. But you miss so much. You're so focused on the dark side of life, you miss the beauty of it. You're so preoccupied with the tiny details, you miss the richness of relationships. Watson's old description of me. Holmes is a calculating machine, a brain without a heart. As deficient in human sympathy as he is preeminent in intelligence. But at least that was in a time when my intelligence was unique. And you see, now there is an entire wing at police headquarters dedicated to that which I once did alone. Even my deductions are absurdly out of date. You can't expect to always be right. I almost always was. But now... Please give me back my vial and syringe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's just great. Shooting up is gonna fix everything, right? I'm sorry you're having a hard time, but come down to my clinic and I'll introduce you to some people with real problems. The world was not put here for your gaming pleasure, Mr. Holmes. You can't just drop out when the game goes against you. You only grow by...
facing challenges by going through them and coming out the other side better for that experience. There may not be a Sherlock Holmes of the 1890s anymore, but there clearly is a Sherlock Holmes of the 1990s. A hugely valuable man who can control his own destiny if he doesn't whip out. And as far as Booth and Pavone are concerned, I happen to believe that what goes around comes around. Sooner or later, someone will provide damning evidence against them, and they will be condemned. Or maybe not. But there are plenty of other crimes for you to solve. Plenty of other people for you to help if you weren't so busy wallowing in your own personal problems. I've got no interest in hanging out with someone who's up to his eyeballs and self-pity. I'm much more interested in a detective I was reading about tonight. A detective who always said there is nothing more stimulating than a case where everything goes against you. Suggestion. Working on behalf of my first 20th century clients, Lieutenant and Mrs. Ortega. Watch it, dude. I got 50 megabytes of brothers with me. I don't think so. You're alone. All I got to do is yell. Not in a library. Bad form, old boy. How'd you know I'd be here? I saw you yesterday with a Dewey Decimal book, and the pavements in front of the library were wet, but your shoes were dry. So you were obviously on route to return the book, as you did today. I also know a few other things about you. You are an electronics wizard with handmade devices you use for breaking into automobiles and changing traffic lights. Your father is a petty thief in Folsom Prison. Your mother is doing the best she can, working in a bakery. You have been arrested seven times. The first, when you were 11 years old, for stealing a box of electrical components. And your real name is Julius Castaneda. So what, you're a cop? No. But I got into that computer and read your rap sheet. Rap sheet? Right. I also heard you say you bear a grudge against Henrik Pavon. Yeah, so? How would you like to get even? This is like dive bombing the Death Star, man. You know, Pavon, he don't mess around. He can one guy with a steamroller. I like to see fatal error flashing. Julius, we have a chance here. Julius, we have a chance here to bring down Pavon for good. Pavon, what are we doing at Booth's house? That's one barracuda too many, all right? I believe there is a connection. No, no, they rivals big time, man. The only connection they got is they both put your heart out and eat it raw. I'll see you later. Julius. <laughs> we'll also be saving the life of a good man named Louis Ortega. Do you want old and Pavon to keep going so we can destroy more people like Ortega? Like your friend, Billy? All right, let's do this. Let's rock and roll, man. Let's do it. Okay, turn your hat around, man. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's try sideways. Okay, pull the straps out. There you go. Yeah. Ah! It's like daylight. Yeah, night vision gods, man. Point five lux. You see any eyes? Uh, security camps on me. Check the roof of the house. Yes. Corner, panning slowly, 13 second cycles, judging by my pulse. Okay, let's see what else we got. Ah, 120 watt tomato. Tomato? Uh, infrared, man. Probably what trashed you last night. How does one circumvent it? Sweatless, man. We throw our own tomato back at it. No signal interference. We're like invisible men, man. Cold. Huh? Cold. Very good. Fine. I think you mean cool. Quite so. What am I doing here? Prepared for the drop? No. I mean, I've never gone up against guys as bad as Pavone or Booth. This is dangerous doo-doo, Sherwood. Julius. <clears throat> Julius. One can only grow by facing challenges. Well, then I'm gonna be king-sized by the time this one's over. All right, man. 
I'm jamming. Let's do this. What about the dog? Kiss my ultrasonics. Excellent. Now, stay low, stay low. This should do nicely. Okay, okay, hear your long eyes, man. 7x50 mag and... No, man, no, you gotta take off the night scope first. Oh, yes. Of course. How's that earplug feel? What? I said, how does it feel? Oh, it's quite comfortable, thank you. No one there yet. Okay. When they come, you'll be able to see and hear them, all right? How did you get so interested in these devices? Streets are a dead end, man. Let's see develop a real skill. Now, have you ever considered turning your skill towards something more rewarding than petty theft? They waited nearly an hour before Holmes finally had some luck. Yeah, yes. The motion camera. Rolling. A sound will be on there. Yeah, yeah, whatever you hear. I'm listening for bad guys. Can, can you hear? Can you hear what he said? Uh-huh. Stop for a minute, report in, please. Red alert, man. Red alert. Move it over there. Come on. Right, Lucy, Lucy, you owes me this tape for the special one. Show me where to put the corkscrew. Ah! A clean getaway. Speak for yourself. Oh, my God, what happened? Oh, it's just a superficial wound due to his rather ungraceful exit from booths. You went back there? It was wonderful. We... What's my wine doing here? I was going to sample it. Uh, I'm, like, bleeding here, man. Uh, ow. Weren't you trying to break into my car? Oh, that was your car. If you don't mind, this is a rather rare bottle from the personal cellar of the Emperor Franz Josef at Schönbrunn Palace, and I thought I'd save it for a special occasion. Wait, first you attack him, then you risk your life for him? What, they get back at Pavon? But why'd you go to Booth's? We suspect a connection. When Booth removed my papers from his safe, I saw another file with a number on it. Lieutenant Ortega's badge number, which I'd seen in a trophy case at the precinct. Amy! Hey! Oh, sorry, you mean to interrupt. It was that guy wearing my shirt. Did you enjoy the Italian meal you ate when you wore it last? No, stop it. Well, who is this? Who is this guy? Ask me that, Frankie. Get out of my house. I can't believe it. Who is that? Come walking in like this. What? Does he want this to you? What? Who is that guy? I don't want to get into it. What? What is he living with you? Yes. I. No, I mean, it's complicated. I thought we had a good thing going. No, Max. We had an idealized thing. An artist who reminded me of my father. Except my father was trustworthy. Good night, Max. Amy, I want to know who is that guy. Amy! Amy! Italian meal? Mm, uh, just a tomato sauce on the sleeve with a fleck of oregano and basil and the unmistakable scent of garlic. His dinner date was a woman with curly red hair who wore too much makeup and has the fondness of whipped cream. Hear me. Will you give me some ideas as to what's going on? Until I'm in possession of all the facts, I prefer uh, not to dive. Very well. A beetle? And what do you observe? Well, um. Extremely long mandibles. Yes, which clearly identify it as King Kin Dedeli. See? Commonly called tiger beetle? Yes. The third murder linked to tigers. Third, but the piranha. Also known as tricky fish or. Not tiger fish. Just so. Now, yesterday I saw Pavon wearing a certain ring. A semi precious quartz with a luminescent vertical band known as tiger's eye. So I ran a global search connecting tiger and Pavon using. Police files? But how did you do that? Our Detective Griffin was kind enough to enter his access code in my presence, and, uh... Antonio Pavon? Henri Pavon's younger brother. He was a wrestler in Colombia known as... El Tigre! All right! Tony the Tiger. Okay, but I'm still Big Willie. How does Lieutenant Ortega fit into this? All three victims were Lieutenant Ortega's close friends or mentors. And why were they killed? Because Tony the Tiger was killed in a drug arrest. By Lieutenant Ortega. Check it out. So Pavon is killing Ortega's closest friends for vengeance? Mm, it would appear so. But where's Ortega? Is he dead too? Not yet, but we have only until 2.30 p.m. tomorrow to find him. Oh, that's what you heard at Booth. Part of it. How does Booth know? It's... All in good time, Winslow. Right now, we must get to... The police, yes. No. No. Detective Griffin wouldn't appreciate my efforts yet. We must visit Mrs. Ortega. We can't do that. Home since 11.30. Yes. 
and Lieutenant Luis Ortega will be facing certain brutal death in just 15 hours. Losing Ronald Hunt was a terrible blow to Luis, and then Mrs. Browder killed by those fish, now Jacob Weiss by those terrible beetles. So your husband was in the midst of gathering his last major evidence against Pavon? Yes. Luis said he finally had enough to bring Pavon down, a huge step towards clearing the drug traffic out of this city. Luis had been after Pavon forever. He almost caught him in a drug raid two weeks ago. Where Antonio Pavon was killed. Yes, and then Luis heard rumors of a huge heroin shipment coming, said this would finish Pavon. Do you know where Luis is? Not yet. But I have information that no harm can befall Luis before 2.30 tomorrow. Do you happen to know from where your husband was abducted? No, he was working on a stakeout. Somewhere on the south side. Might I see the last clothes he wore? Certainly. <laughs> you are an excellent laundress, madam. Even I can find no clues as to where your husband was staked out. Why don't you ask the department or Bernie Savita? I think he'd been alternating on the stakeout. He's Luis's partner sometimes. He's one of his closest friends. Closest friends? Lieutenant Savita. Hello? I'm not happy. Oh, my God. Was I feared? Is he dead? Yes. He couldn't have happened long ago. He's still warm. That's odd. What? His limbs are stiff. He shouldn't have this much rigor mortis yet. Can you make a small incision in the radial artery? No bleeding. It's completely clotted. Hmm. That accounts for the stiffness, but what could have caused it? Venom. From a snake of the elapidal family. Note the two tiny dots on the back of his hand. I should say he was bitten by an Australian Notechis scutatis, commonly known as... Don't tell me. Tiger snake? Just so. This particular one is black and yellow, four feet six inches long, the right eye larger than the left, with one partly broken fang. Oh, come on. How could you possibly know all that? Because I am looking at it. <laughs> no, don't move. It is coiled on the stairs, right behind your neck. Holmes. Holmes. Now then, on the count of three, you will dive directly towards me. One. I thought you said on three. I was afraid to flinch. Thanks for the confidence. <clears throat> and for saving me. You're welcome. You're actually quite bad, Sophie. Really? Yes. And your perfume suits you. Why? Roses with a breath of citrus. I like your personality. Is that a compliment? It could be taken as such, I suppose. Winslow. Yes? Would you consider... What? Getting on with our case. Check his trousers or turnips. Always invaluable. Come, come, Winslow. I, too, regret we are unable to save Lieutenant Savita. Unless we hurry, Lieutenant Ortega may also be. Uh -huh. A ticket to see someone called Bart Daly. Uh, close. Daly City is this house side station on the Bart Bay area rapid transit. Uh, yes, of course. Anything? Oh, just some, some kind of dust or powder. Uh, chalk? No. Cement. This is completely marvelous. You can let your fingers do the walking. What a concept. All right, this is Daly City. And there's what we're looking for. Lieutenant Ortega was staked out here. The object of his surveillance across the street. Peacock tracking. Peacock being? Pavon in Spanish. Well done, Winslow. You're really getting into the spirit of things. <laughs> Seeing Mrs. Ortega seems to have had an effect upon you. Yes. I'd begun to understand how Holmes and Lieutenant Ortega could have such a strong commitment to solving these mysteries. What's that yellow ribbon on the building? It's a police tape. It means they've already checked out our lead. Don't despair, Winslow. It's been my experience that even the best police often leave an item or two unchecked. Holmes showed me where the scuffle and abduction of Ortega had taken place. He was amazingly able to read the traces of it, despite the police who had trooped through since. We looked carefully for nearly an hour before I heard his characteristic little squeak of pleasure. Huh? Rika! Winslow, look here! On the wall, where someone sitting with their hands tied behind them could have scratched a clue as to where they were being taken. What do you make of it? P-29 with the wavy line? <laughs> we're on the scent. Holmes refused to tell me what he'd concluded until he'd done some verification. 
He had me drop him near the Embarcadero. By the next morning, I was getting nervous. It was 9 o'clock, and I couldn't stop thinking about what Lieutenant Ortega would be facing in a few more hours. Dr. Winslow? Uh, yes. Bye-bye, Katie. Bye. I'm really sorry to bother you, but there's a woman in the ER who won't speak to anyone but you. In there, please. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. What the hell are you doing? Ow! Oh, hurt. How on earth did you recognize me? Your shoes. I thought I'd slough them up rather well. Not rather well enough. I also observed the configuration of the saber scar on your left cheek. And... Oh, my God, I've been hanging out with you too much. Why are you dressed in this ridiculous... Did you find Lieutenant Ortega? Yes. He has yet to be rescued, however. I want you to meet me in a restaurant on Washington Square called La Fenetra to witness the successful completion of our case. What? Wait a minute. And be there promptly at 1.30. Oh, and uh, it is imperative you bring your motorbike to have a very busy morning. So, adieu. So there I was in this classy little restaurant where all I could afford was a Perrier. It was already 1.20, my stomach was in a knot, and who do I realize is across the room? Holmes' enemy number one. I'd seen him on a police report, but seeing him in the flesh was creepy. About 15 minutes later, I was really getting antsy when God's gift of crime detection finally walked in. Ah, sorry I'm late. I had some final business to attend to. Do you see who's here? May I suggest you find a place where the atmosphere is less polluted? Oh, excuse me. He asked me to drive us up Telegraph Hill on my bike. Will you please tell me what's going on? Everything that should be. There's nothing to be done for a while. We might as well enjoy the view. Holmes, I reworked my entire schedule so I can help you. I deserve to know what's it's going on. It's nothing personal, Winslow. It's just my own damnable nature, I suppose. It's omne notum pro magnifico. Everything unknown passes for something splendid? Exactly. The magician gets no credit once he's explained his trick. I think I've always feared if I reveal too much my method of working, people will come to the conclusion that I'm actually very ordinary after all oh. however you do deserve to know that i am somewhat impressed by you don't patronize me okay just one customer true detective is penetrating a disguise as you did with mine because watson never managed it listen mr holmes and a true friend is someone who helps you when you're depressed you're a whetstone for my mind winslow you stimulated me out of my doldrum and put me back in contact with my mistress you what who is she Women have seldom been an attraction to me, Winslow. My brain has always governed my heart. My work is my mistress. Casework, not cocaine, is my real drug. There is nothing more stimulating than a case where everything goes against you. Yes, but what about this case? The Lieutenant Ortega will it be... It would appear so. Oh, this city has changed in 90 years. <laughs> This tower wasn't here when last I stood on the hilltop. You are completely amazing. It is 220, a man's life is hanging in the balance, and you're up here admiring the view. When one has done all one can, it is wise to calm the mind by quiet contemplation. A tenet of the Buddhism of Ceylon. It's not Ceylon anymore, it's Sri Lanka. Even the names of countries have changed. Winslow, please accept my apologies for the inconveniences I've caused you. I realize that I'm a rather difficult person to share rooms with, and I promise to oh. vacate your premises as soon as possible. Perhaps by way of recompense, I could offer you a few insights into the Victoria novel I see you're writing. Look, you can stay as long as you need to, all right? Right now, I would really appreciate it if you would just tell me what... Ah! 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 I was really beginning to worry that these violent mood swings of his might indicate a truly unbalanced mind. Start the motor bicycle. Quickly, down the hill at once. The Embarcadero, Pier 29. That's what Pier 29 meant? Yes, I suspected the wavy line was a universal symbol for war, hence my logical deduction. Harry Watson and Winslow, the game's afoot, but not a moment to lose.
You saw Ortega last night? Yes, he's being held in the warehouse on the pier, where at 2.30 he'll be handed over in person to perform by James Maliati Booth. What, Booth has Ortega? Of course. But the Tiger murders. Devilishly sinister. An elegant motif, is it not? I recognize it at once as coming from the aesthetically twisted mind of a Moriarty. For one style is far more brutish. He kills with steamrollers. So Booth committed the Tiger murders in honor of Pavon's brother Tony? Yes, to avenge Tony's death and cause grief to Louis Ortega. And now Booth is going to hand over Ortega himself so that, what, Pavon can kill Louis personally and complete the vengeance? Yes. Careful now. doing this for Pavon. Why would Booth do anyone a favor? To get something in return, what? More, Winslow. Always more. You've told the police all this, right? Holmes. Oh, come that way. Tell me we're not in this alone. Certainly we're not in this alone. Yes, Holmes here. Hey, homie, I'm on Pavone's ass, but he just turned on to Pier 15, not Pier 29. What's shaking, Sherlock? Pier 15, but that's not right. I don't want to hear that. Uh, alert the others as to the change, Julius, and proceed as planned. Don't slow down. I've got a red light, Holmes. Now do proceed swiftly, Pier 29! Gentlemen, I am really sorry to have bothered you, so I'll just... Having an outing with the boys, Detective? Where's Ortega? Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Did you call them this tip? Uh, no, that, uh, that was probably a friend of mine. Um, Holmes? Please, God, not him. Where is he? Uh, well, he, um, he jumped on a boat, you see, so I'm not exactly... All right, move it, Ortega, come on. Pavone's guys are waiting for you. Let's go. Fall out! No, no, no! Ah! No, 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 Take this young woman in for questioning, Detective. She seems a bit, uh... Like it's for you, ma'am? Griffin. Detective, this is Sherlock Holmes. Ooh, I'm gonna pan-fry your little limey ass. Over your right shoulder, you'll see a cabin cruiser approaching. And there's someone here who wishes to say hello. Thanks for the pen, mate. 
a grip. Get the Coast Guard in the chopper out to that white cabin cruiser. There's a tiger loose on it. And the inside is filled with heroin. Come on. Ortega's got you, pal. And both of you are under arrest for suspicion of kidnapping. Don't embarrass yourself, Detective. You'll never prove that I've any connection to those men out there. After all these years, you should know better. He's right, Holmes. Without any hard evidence, Booth will squirm out of this one, too. Detective, did you impound Mr. Booth's car as I instructed? Yes, yeah, so what? Perhaps we might find something incriminating within it. I'm afraid not, Mr. Whoever you are. It better be good. What's, uh, what's that on the back seat? A case of wine. I don't know how it got there, but it's no big deal. Au contraire, monsieur. It's quite a large deal. That looks to be a case of extremely rare wine, but a chemical analysis of the bottles will show that they contain not wine at all, but an 87% solution of cocaine. I estimate the street value in excess of a million pounds at $1.568 million. Whatever the hell it is, I know absolutely nothing about it. I never saw those bottles before. I believe a careful search for Mr. Booth's fingerprints may perhaps prove otherwise. Well, we'll check it out. And this will also prove useful in securing a conspiracy to commit murder conviction. My associate and I recorded a rather damning conversation of Mr. Booth's, detailing his engineering of the Tiger murders, and this exchange of Lieutenant Ortega and the Tiger which was to eat him in return for that boatload of heroin and a massive new criminal partnership with Pavone. Working together, they plan to bring San Francisco to its knees. My gift to you, America's first Holmes video. All right, Booth, you have the right to remain silent. Get somebody in here to read this slime is rights. Only called Holmesy. I'm the worst enemy you could ever hope to make, mister. The blood of the Moriarty still runs in my veins. You haven't seen the last of me. Get him out of here. I noticed that Holmes actually seemed to get a little rush from that possibility. So, when you were defending my car from the street gang, you were actually protecting your stash of cocaine. I would have endeavored to check their burglarizing in any event. <laughs> yeah, right, but not until they got to my car. <laughs> your lack of faith is most disappointing. Besides, look at what we've just accomplished. Your skill at driving us down Telegraph Hill from where I could clearly observe Booth leaving the restaurant was critical to the timing of my plan. I requested you bring your motorcycle, knowing you could maneuver it through traffic better than your automobile. Wouldn't it have been easier just to wait on the street? But the vista was not as pleasing. Besides, I felt the chase added a touch of drama and excitement that the romantic Miss Winkler might enjoy. <laughs> so, uh, you alerted Griffin ahead of time? Anonymously, of course. And then had Zapper's pal save that little row to distract Booth's driver long enough so Zapper could plant the wine bottle. Bravo, Winslow. Not exactly legal, Holmes. But moral, Winslow, moral. <laughs> But how in the world did Booth's fingerprint... You really it? must keep honing those powers of observation, Winslow. While you were at the restaurant, did you not see Mr. Booth handle a bottle of wine offered to him by a white-gloved French waiter? Yes. That bottle of wine quickly found its way back into my case. I knew, of course, that Booth would be dining there by observing his desk calendar during my first encounter with him. Amazing. So you paid the waiter to offer him the bottle of wine. Oh, Winslow. I was the waiter. Did you see this? Booth's friends were found on the bottle and he's being held without bail. And a man calling himself Sherlock Holmes was pivotal in finally bringing the underworld chieftains within reach of the law. I don't understand. What? This video recording device. I thought I'd arranged to make a transcription of America's Most Wanted. Instead, I got something called Soul Trade. So, Holmes, what's your plan? A uh, return trip to England? In time, perhaps. For now, I'm quite content being a consulting detective right here in San Francisco. Oh, good morning, Dr. Winslow. Bless your heart. Thank you very much for inviting me to move in here with you. Uh, right up this way, boys. Well, you do have that unused artist's loft. <laughs> Where else were she and my belongings to go? Holmes. I mean, you did invite me to stay temporarily. Yes, I did, but I... Sorry. 
You wouldn't turn her out to sleep with Lefty, would you? Who's Lefty? Yo, like ding dong. Yo, homes boy. Hey, man, busting Pavone and Booth was like cold and all, but why didn't you tell us we had our hands on a million bucks worth of snow? Oh, didn't I? Don't be dissing us, man. Julius, I would never dream of dissing you. You and your chums will share in the reward money when it arrives. I have no intention of robbing you off. Ripping. Right. I also plan to offer you gainful employment as my new Baker Street Irregulars. Say what? I foresee many future investigations where your street sense and skills will prove invaluable. And on the right side of the law, usually. In addition, I've arranged for you, Julius, to have an apprenticeship with a security firm. I imagine they'll find your particular skills rather enlightening. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but someone has come calling. Doubtless a young, attractive, blonde female prostitute who has read our story in the papers and seeks our aid. You are staring, Winslow. Are you Big Willie? How did you know that? Because I observed the young woman eyeing our house from across the street. She was clutching a newspaper and her white ankle boots, extremely short white dress with red fringe and piping, revealing so much leg and cleavage to leave no doubt as to her profession. Well, let's go check her out. Mm -hmm. She's no hooker, Holmes. You just described a cheerleader for the 49ers. What? The men who came to dig for gold in 1849 had women to cheer them on, dressed like that. No wonder there was a gold rush. No, no, Holmes, you still have a lot to learn about the 1990s. Do I have your permission, then, to continue my contemporary education whilst ascertaining the cause of the young woman's distress? I had to admit that meeting and working with this irascible character was the most fun I'd had in years. Though he might be more humble, there's no police like Holmes. Be my guest. Show the young lady up, if you please, Mrs. Hudson. On the porch, please. 